Hello, friends. My name is Joe Fortune. Um, I'm the General Secretary of the Cooperative Party. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to host uh, this uh, session of Corp Live. Um, for those who uh, have been with us before, you know what these, our sessions are about. We're about exploring particular aspects of uh, cooperative policy, cooperative values and principles, how we apply them to some uh, and varied areas of our campaigning, of our, uh, uh, of our policy work right, uh, right across the country at all levels of government. Uh, a couple of bits of housekeeping. Uh, first thing to say is that this session is recorded. Um, uh, therefore, if you don't wish to appear on the uh, uh, on, on the recording, please feel free uh, to turn your camera off. Why we record them uh, is so that uh, colleagues who uh, aren't with us uh, today are able to benefit from the uh, the discussion and the content uh, into the future. Uh, so do do uh, uh, turn your camera off if that's uh, something that you wish to do. Uh, secondly, uh, is just to say that if you wish to use our uh, closed captions, please do. Uh, it, you'll find that at the bottom of our screen. Um, so it, with uh, CC. Uh, down at the bottom, please do uh, take advantage of that if, if that's something that you uh, require. So two bits of housekeeping. Third bit, uh, really important, is that we want to hear from yourselves through this session. We want to understand your own views and have discussion with yourself. So as we go along, if there are points you wish to make, do raise your virtual hand and we can we can come to you and unmute you after, after we've heard from our speaker uh, this evening. Um, now, what I would say is that uh, we keep everyone muted uh, just so that we can make sure that we can uh, benefit from our, our, our speakers. Um, now, the, the only last thing to do just before I have a discussion here in the kitchen with uh, the three year old um, is to introduce our, oh, she's four, forgive me, she is four and she's only just turned four, uh, which is why she's so indignant about it, um, is to introduce our speaker. Um, and we're going to talk about transport, we're going to talk about passenger voice, we're going to talk about what is important to transport users of all different uh, all different modes. We're going to understand a little bit about how uh, the country's feeling about its uh, bus and rail. And I want to talk a little bit about accountability, I want to talk a little bit about cooperative approaches to transport as well. But it's really important that we hear from uh, Louise Coward today. Uh, Louise is Head of Insight and Passenger Focus. For those of you uh, not f uh, familiar necessarily uh, with Passenger Focus, uh, there will be many who are. Uh, passenger focus are the people who are looking out uh, to hear from ourselves, transport users, making sure that they're a, a, a powerful voice uh, for uh, the user in uh, UK transport. Uh, but Louise, I'm taking your introduction. I really shouldn't. Uh, so I'm gonna, we're going to hear from you, Louise. Going to give us that uh, insight and then we'll take the discussion from there. So Louise, you're really welcome. Thanks very much for making some time uh, to be with us tonight and over to yourself. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm just going to share my screen, which hopefully will work. And fingers crossed, you can see what I can see in front of me. So that's all good. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for inviting Transport Focus along today. Um, I'm Louise Coward. I've got the great job of being Head of Insight at Transport Focus, which um, is, is a really great job to have. Um, I think I'm very lucky to do what I do. And um, I'm going to give you a really quick intro to sort of who we are, what we do. And I think most importantly for today, um, some of what we're finding out at the moment from users of transport. Uh, which will hopefully prompt some, some nice discuss discussion afterwards. Um, so on to my next slide. Um, effectively, we're the organisation that represents users of Transport Focus. It's our job to listen to what users are saying and then to use this information to influence decision makers. So we represent bus, coach and tram users outside of England, um, outside of London in England. We also look after rail passengers across the whole of Great Britain. And um, we also represent um, users of the um, strategic road network, which is motorways and major A roads, which is why we're called transport focus now. We, we used to be passenger focused, but when we um, got the remit for uh, road users, we had to have a bit of a name change because of course um, they're not passengers, um, well, they can be passengers, but more likely than not, road users can be drivers, of course, too. Um, we're completely evidence-based. Um, we don't work on anecdotes. 
everything that we do is published and we encourage other people to use our reports and our data. Um, our reports are all published on our website and quantitative data is put on our data hub and we encourage people to do their own analysis, to interrogate it, to test out their own theories and to um, you know, get maximum use from the data that we provide. Um, and that's publicly accessible through our website. Um, and yeah, I mean, just as, as an example, really, of how integral Insight is to Transport Focus, um, there's seven of us in the Insight team, um, which is a really big proportion um, of an organisation that's only just over 40 people in total. And we spend around a third of our budget on Insight. And the evidence that we collect, we use it to work with operators, with organisations like Network Rail, National Highways, central government, local government. We regularly meet politicians from both government and opposition. We sit on a number of regional transport boards. For instance, we're on the Greater Manchester Mayor's Transport Board, the West Yorkshire Bus Alliance and everything. So the organisation is just really keen to get all this great information that we find out being used to influence so that it, it sort of gets to the right people so that they can use it to act in the best interests of the transport users. Um, and in terms of how we collect our evidence at Transport Focus, um, effectively, we, we use lots of lots of different methods, um, depending what we want to find out and what our timescales are, we um, may choose a different um, different method um, accordingly. So um, these are just six recent examples of reports that we've published that are on our website. Um, and the methods that we've used across these are um, large scale quantitative surveys, some of which are using online panels, some of which are basically getting out and about and intercepting people. So for instance, um, the bottom left one there, motorway service user survey, really the only way you can ask people, what was it like today using the motorway services is to go and find them as they're leaving. Um, and it's the same when, when it comes to people making journeys by rail, you really can only make sure that, that people are using the station at the time that you're interested in. If you go there and ask them if they would mind giving you their opinion. Um, but equally, we use online methods, we use focus groups, we use depth interviews, we get out and about talking to people as they make journeys, uh, we monitor social media, media, and we also have our own panel of transport users and conduct some insight ourselves. And um, if, if you're interested, you can sign up and join our transport user panel um, via our website. Um, and we, we regularly ask people to help us and tell us what they think about all kinds of things using that. Um, I'm going to just share a few headlines now, firstly on rail um, and then on bus to kind of set the scene on what users are saying at the moment about their use of transport and what's going on. So, um, obviously COVID came along coming up for three years ago now and it did change how we do things. Um, some of our methods had to change, some were paused for a while, uh, but something that we have been doing since May 2020 is on a weekly basis, we screen 2000 people and ask them, have you used rail or bus in the past seven days? And if they have, we ask them their satisfaction with that journey. And Overall satisfaction levels, um, as I said, we do have this data going back for coming up, up for three years now, and that is all on our website um, on the data hub, but this chart just shows the last 12 weeks or so. Um, and we can see that overall satisfaction with the last rail journey fluctuates on a weekly basis, but it, it generally falls between sort of 80 and 90% of users saying that they were satisfied with their most recent journey um, and the dark green at the bottom there is the proportion saying they're very satisfied and that tends to be about half of the total satisfied people um, and a similar proportion saying that they were fairly satisfied. So broadly we're looking at eight out of ten rail passengers saying that they were fairly satisfied or better with their last rail journey. 
Um, when we ask them about some more specific um, components, though, of satisfaction, um, we do see a much bigger range of scores. So things like um, the scheduled journey time, so the timetable, um, their personal security and the station overall perform relatively well and more than 80% are satisfied on those. But we do see lower satisfaction scores on things like value for money, which doesn't come as a surprise, I'm sure, but also things like the reliability of the internet connection and the information that was available on how busy the train would be before they travelled, something that did become much more important to users um, during COVID um, and still remains important. Um, and all the other sort of measures are in between those two extremes. Um, and just a couple more slides on rail, which I'll, I'll quickly take you through. These are from a large piece of work that we published at the end of last year, where we spoke to more than 15,000 rail passengers. And effectively, what we wanted to do was really to identify right now for people using rail, what matters most, what is the really important things to rail users just now. And this chart shows, um, well, it shows all 25 measures that we asked them about. Um, but in the diagram there, we can see the top 10. Um, so the absolutely most important things to passengers. And the top two there we can see are value for money, for the price tickets, and reliability and punctuality, uh, followed by frequency of trains and accurate information accurate and timely information. Um, and I don't want to go into the tech, techie gubbins of how it was done, but effectively it was using a, a technique that's called max diff, where it measures trading off relative importance to different aspects and it scales everything relative to each other. And effectively what would happen is if all these 25 aspects scored equally and were equally important to um, users, every single one of them would have a score of 100. But of course, they don't all have a score of 100, which is how we get this top 10. But the reason I, I'm talking about this is the two at the top, the price of train tickets um, offering value for money and reliability and punctuality are so much more important than the others. So they both score um, over 200. Whereas the next one, sufficiently frequent trains, um, scores 148. So there is a real gap between those top two and then the others. Um, and then the, the kinds of scores that you see down at the bottom, um, for instance, the sufficient space on the train for luggage, in relative terms scored 36. So overall, it's significantly less important to users than um, the ones up at the top there. But of course, we do need to remember that these are across the whole sample of rail users. It certainly doesn't mean that the aspects that are lower overall aren't absolutely the most important elements for some users, particularly people who perhaps have disabilities or are more less confident using rail or um, different situations that just mean something. You know, if you're traveling with a lot of luggage, then you could argue the sufficient space on the train for luggage is probably the most important thing out of all of them. So um, it's good to get that general picture, but it's not saying, of course, that it's exactly the same for all, all users. Um, and I mean, this is this is available um, in the report on our website, but effectively what, what this grid is doing is overlaying that importance that we just looked at with satisfaction in the quadrant layout. So we can see that in the bottom right box in red there, those are, we would say, the absolute priorities for the railway. They are things that are really important to passengers, but they have lower satisfaction levels. And we can see over there the price of train, train tickets offering value for money it scores low satisfaction, but it is incredibly important as we saw in the last slide. And yeah, the top right box there, priorities um, in the sort of yellowy color, they are also really important, but in relative terms, um, satisfaction is already higher 
but it doesn't mean that they can be ignored. They need to be maintained at least. And it doesn't mean that there isn't still room for improvement on those factors too. Um, and then I'm just going to quickly sort of take you through a few slides to look at, at bus users, um, hopefully a little bit quicker because I'm conscious of time and I want to give you an opportunity to, to talk about these, uh, but also the format's the same, so um, probably need less explanation. Um, so similar to rail on bus at the overall level, satisfaction with the most recent journey in the last seven days is between sort of 81 and 90 percent with again about half and half um, within that being very or fairly satisfied and when we look at um, those individual elements we can again see that some of the factors relatively do pretty well so safety of the driving personal security while on board uh, the temperature on the bus and the cleanliness all do score relatively high with well into at the 80% plus on a regular basis, but it's the same things coming out scoring lower value for money information, both before the journey and during the journey and the frequency of buses on the route do relatively score lower. Um, and you could say there's more room for improvement on those in the passenger view. And um, just in terms of what would bus passengers say are the most important things to them, what needs to be improved um, on the bus network, uh, I should point out that this was done before COVID, so it was back in 2019. Um, and I would, from other work that we've done, estimate that um, things like cleanliness on board if we repeated this exercise right now would rise up the ranks and become more important um, because we know that things like cleanliness ventilation and crowding did um, become much more top of mind to users during covid and haven't faded away um, at all but it's buses running more often going to the right frequency buses being on time, value for money. It's, it's that absolute um, making it work, making buses reliable so that people can rely on them to get where they need to go when they want to go there. That is really, really important to bus users and rail users too. Um, so they're the absolute sort of priorities and where passengers of buses felt improvement was really required. Um, and I'll stop sharing my screen now. Um, if you just bear with me a second, if I just find the right button. Ooh. Someone's Thanks. killed it for me. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Louise, for that. And I think it's a really important place to start any discussion about transport. Any discussion should start at those uh, ourselves, users, users of public transport. Um, there's also a discussion to be had about these are the people who are on public transport now. We know uh, that we need many more people uh, to, be, uh, to, to use public transport for all of the important reasons uh, in behind that. So there's a, a discussion about this is what we have here and now. This is what is important to these people. But of course, those percentages don't account for the vast majority of the journeys that we make. Uh, you know, I, I may be wrong, uh, but rail will account for seven or eight percent of all commuter journeys each day. We need that number to be much bigger. So how can we turn a system uh, to allow for that bus, bus uh, use? I, I guess uh, each day must be around 20 percent of journeys, maybe a bit more. Louise, I'm looking for you just in case I'm way out, um, something of that sort of order. Um, again, we need that to be more. Uh, so there's a discussion to be had with, about how to uh, how to create a uh, an improved uh, passenger uh, public transport system as well. But it must start from the understanding of what people need and, uh, and what uh, people uh, its experiences are here and now. Um, so that, thank you for that. And, and there will be questions uh, on that, uh, on your really interesting and important uh, presentation. And I will take them and I can already see three. So I've got three in mind. I just wanted to, before we opened into discussion, 
give a little sense of how the, the courts of party comes uh, to this uh, discussion, uh, to this uh, policy area. Now, I, I was working in uh, uh, transport myself in a different lifetime. And when I first started working uh, with the courts of party some uh, many years ago uh, now, was when I put forward a proposal to a state owned operator who was operating rail here in the UK, that there should be a, uh, there should be a profit share uh, because their particular franchise only went through one county. So it was only people in one county who they were really servicing in and out of London. And it went up to the board of this state operator. Uh, and I suggested that that, given that they were largely servicing one county's worth of people, that that would be a reasonable way of running the service. It came back down that, no, that isn't how that they wish to, to operate. Uh, and I thought there must be a better way. There must be a way of increasing accountability, increasing that say and, and democratic uh, say within public transport. And that's what took me to the, the that one experience, uh, took me to work with the Cooperative Party. So since then, in the Cooperative Party, we've generated policy in and around how to democratise network rail. Network Rail is the body which spends uh, the vast majority of uh, money in the system uh, on, on rail, both freight and passenger. Um, I think it's about 9 billion of the 12 billion a year goes to Network Rail. Um, Network Rail itself uh, had some aspects of democracy within it. Uh, they had Network Rail members. Um, they were a, a an organisation because they are, in a sense, publicly owned, they're a, they're a company limited by guarantee, that there needed to be some uh, accountability within it. Now, over the time, that accountability has withered uh, as government control has increased. So now you'll see Network Rail uh, discuss uh, matters which really they're saying that the Secretary of State is on is in, in control of. But of course, there should be a voice for pa a voice for the taxpayer, a voice for the user within Network Rail. I think that that's a straightforward piece. So we started work there. We believe that there isn't room for profit leakage and stakeholder uh, shareholder profit leakage out of passenger services. We think that out of the two and a half billion, two point seven billion pound which goes into passenger rail each year. Uh, it is it is unworkable uh, that there is a shareholder dividend. We don't believe that risk is well well um, uh, 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 divided up between taxpayer, government, and an, an operator, and we think that that needs to change. So we've looked at how we can have passenger involvement, democratic passenger involvement in service delivery as well. Uh, we've looked, and this is something which obviously works in cooperatives. You know, this works in 39, uh, 39 billion pound uh, of uh, turnover uh, of, the, uh, of the economy already. It's not a new thing. It's something which has been around a couple of hundred years old, nearly as old as the train tracks. Now, I think from my point of view that there is there is absolute need for increased accountability to hear the, the insights that Louise has just given us in a different way within the industry. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, is that voice strong enough to be able to take the decisions that we want to see within passenger transport? And is it, is it, it's, a, it's a big question because there will be different views on it. So we've got democratic uh, models and I encourage people to have a look at democratic public ownership for the 21st century, uh, where we, we list how that passenger rail system can operate uh, with, with uh, on a not-for-profit mut uh, mutual basis. Uh, and I wanted to just touch on buses. Uh, before we opened up as well um, and there were some really interesting things and Louise you said something there which I think uh, is hugely important and, and you rightly uh, uh, delivered the data is an insight as I imagine that you you, you would and the, the, the sentence was something along the lines of uh, the frequency of bus and you said there's an area for improvement and I think it was one of the lowest pieces now I'm gonna and I don't expect uh, transport uh, yourself, Louise, uh, with the, the role and the, the righteous role that you need to take on that quality and quantitative data approach. But I'm going to say that a frequency of a bus means that if we look on the other side of the policy ledger where we're losing millions of bus miles each year on uh, uh, in our bus network, we are having communities cut off from bus services. We are seeing routes withdrawn. Um, we are seeing a, 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 a way in which uh, the, again, risk in some ways between industry and uh, metropolitan areas, individual bus markets is we are seeing buses leave our road uh, and therefore we are losing people to uh, all of the things that we know we need. 
uh, you know, the, the trips to the hospital, trips to employment, trips to leisure, recreation, all the things which make our, our community sustainable. And we just saw it in the data. We saw it from transport uh, within the within the presentation. But that in real in outside of the data and in real life means that we're cut off. Uh, we aren't able to level up. We aren't able to access uh, local, regional uh, economic development in the way in, in, in which we should. Now, there is no right now. I'll be from my point of view as a former Labour Party transport advisor as well. There isn't policy which is going to correct that situation because of the way in which the bus industry is fixed. And we know the discussion which happens, out, especially outside of the large Mets, and some people on this call will have experienced it. There will be a bus service in your area, which you know is important. It may well be under threat or have gone. You'll speak to your councillor or your MP, and you'll say, that's a disgrace. We needed that to get to the hospital. We needed that to get in. And the councillor or MP will say, I know, I know. And we've tried everything to keep that route going. And they will have done. And the operator will have said, well, it's not economically viable, so we're going to change it. And we're lost. As a, as a country, we are lost at that point, that critical point. Because we don't own the bus. We don't own where the buses stop, the, 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 the garages. We don't have enough money within the system to create the bus service that we know we need, let alone the one we want. So something needs to change within the bus industry, because if, if we looked at bus industry st statistics, we would see patronage over a long period of time simply going down. Might slow a little bit. There might be some good points, but it goes down. Money goes down in, in this industry, uh, it, it put public money in, be it bus service operator grant, other things like that are cut because they're easy things to cut. There isn't enough service, there isn't enough money in the industry to allow us to have concessionary transport. Really, it's one of those things. It's like childcare. You know, they say there's 33 hours. Well, there, there isn't often because the government doesn't fund it to the level in which they should. And it's the same with concessionary transport. So my point being that we can't continue on this trajectory. It's not sustainable. I think the operators, to a degree, they've taken in buses a profit margin of six, seven, eight percent on average. Some will be up 17, 18 percent. Some will be a bit lower, especially where we've got some franchising now in London and hopefully in Manchester and other metropolitan areas. But they'll say there's not enough. So something needs to change. And I think that that's where the Cooperative Party is so radical. And, and, and I believe that our values are so important because it's in market failure, not individual organizational failure, but market failure, where the cooperative values and principles are, are, are so prevalent and, and powerful. Look at like now I'm going to talk, to talk a little bit about why the court party thinks that it has something valuable to offer within the bus, dis, uh, uh, bus policy discussion. From my point of view, I had one, uh, I had a, uh, a mentor uh, many, many years ago who was involved in uh, transport policy and I was very young and they said there's two things uh, that you're going to need to know. There's this thing called a quality contract and a quality partnership. There's going to be some quality partnerships, but in your lifetime, there won't be any quality contracts. Now, what they were really getting at is the intransigence of, uh, of bus policy. I think that we have to look beyond the operators that we currently have. I'm not interested in first group stage coach. Uh, uh, whoever else owns uh, Arriva. I'm not interested in that, those passenger organisations, to be perfectly honest, um, because I don't believe that they have a long-term future in the market. I don't really believe that they, in some ways, want to be in the market. Look how quickly they turn over. Look how quick they take our routes off. Look how quick that they are to tell yourselves as councillors or communities, well, we don't really want to be here anyway. I don't think they're here for the long term. If you really think about them, in some ways, they've only done 20 or 30 years because they were all in, uh, 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 municipally owned previously, largely. Bus market, deregulation of bus market was uh, the Margaret Thatcher, 1986. It's not, that long, it's not that long ago. Transport policy is based on a 30-year horizon. So that in some ways, they're coming to the end of their horizon. So what comes next? And we have to be focused on what comes next. So I believe that there is no room for profit uh, in, in bus service delivery anymore. I don't think that's where we are. I don't think it, the, the market has is, is done it. What we do have is a, a vibrant community transport not-for-profit sector. 
we have people who wish to run buses on a not-for-profit basis and do valuable, valuable work doing it. We have social enterprises doing London buses. There's red buses along the road from where I am, which are run by social enterprises. There is a different way of doing it. We have to be open-minded to the fact that we have to grow our not-for-profit bus operators. We have to, because there's no one else who's going to do it. There isn't. So it's going to be them who do it. So we may as well get on with it sooner rather than later, is my mind. So that don't that we shouldn't um, thank community transport for what they do. What they do is blooming important and valuable, by the way. But we should be looking to them for the future and saying, actually, it's yourselves who need to grow, and it's yourselves who we want to do. Uh, we want you to do our buses. It, it works. It does work. As I say, there's one in one running bus, uh, a bus I get on. There's one in Manchester. Um, so it does work, and I want to see us as a party embrace that culture embrace the fact that this is uh th this is going to be the future in the interim and there is going to be an interim um i want us to look at community asset because all of us on this uh, on this call will say i hope i suspect will say bus routes are a, a community asset they are they definitely are and as cooperators we know there's legislation which protects community assets in other calls like this we'll talk about pubs post offices We'll talk about playing fields. We'll talk about uh, 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 community centres. And we'll say they're community assets and they must be listed and protected as a community asset. The absurdity of the system we have now, friends, is that you can list a bus stop as a community asset. You can list it. You, can, you and three friends can get together and say, that bus stop, which I use to get to the hospital or place of employment, is a community asset. And then the government will say, yeah, agree. It means nothing about whether a bus is going to stop at that stop. Nothing. You've got the bus stop, fantastic. No bus. We've just had, we, 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 we saw the, the figures. So from my point of view, I think as cooperators, we've got a unique insight into what you do with a community asset, how you protect a community asset. So what I want to see is bus routes being, being able to be designated as a community asset, because that's the asset. It's not the stop. It's where the bus goes. That's what the asset is. I want to see a new government or this government, whichever comes first. Um, uh, and I suspect it might be the new one. Um, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, I want to see a new government or a new approach which says we believe that bus routes are a community asset worth protecting. And if you say that, there's a route to do it. Community asset legislation. And if there's community asset legislation, my proposal is lost. There's traffic commissioners who, who uh, are the arbiter of what is a route and they hold the routes. If we can apply to the traffic commission and say that route is a community asset and there's enough of us in the same way as we, we protect our pub, what we do is we enhance our role and our voice within that bus service delivery. When we're on the doorstep and they say that bus is gone or going, you say, look, we want to protect it as a community asset and there's a way to do it. And if we can do that, what we will gain is time in the negotiation. We'll gain some leverage in that negotiation of which we have no time and le leverage right now. The scariest thing for a politician is a bus company coming and saying they're getting rid of the route tomorrow because there's nothing you can do. Absolutely nothing you can do. So if we can, if we can put forward and we can campaign and we can agitate for community asset legislation to be transposed onto bus routes, I think we can make a material difference. I think we need to build the new world of not-for-profit uh, delivery of bus services anyway, because I think that's inevitable. I think it's going to be. Uh, I think it's going to come to ourselves. I think ultimately the discussion will 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 settle on uh, not-for-profit community uh, providers. But in the short term, I want us to do that. So, and there's some great other things, great things happening in Manchester, great things happening uh, in uh, in Leeds as well. But without the money, without the leverage, without the ownership of the bus. Uh, it's illegal currently for a municipality to set up a bus company, for example. Uh, I think this is something we can do practically. So some thoughts about buses uh, and some thoughts about trains. But I'm interested in your own views, your own thoughts. What should the court party be doing? What, well, what, 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 what view did uh, uh, Louise stimulate uh, for yourselves as well? And we've got lots of uh, contributors, so I'm going to bring in in some uh, here and now. And I think uh, 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 Izzy will help us here, but uh, Dennis and then uh, Rupinder were the first two. So we'll take two now and then uh, take a further two. Over to yourselves. Um, 
I live in uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, we can, Rapinda. Thank you. Okay, oh, sorry. Uh, I live in Redcar uh, now and I have reasonably good buses. I used to live in Derbyshire where the situation was dire. Uh, but what I would like to ask the, uh, the first presenter about is the, um, I've forgotten her name, it seems so long ago, um, that whether the frequency of passenger use, um, the satisfaction data that you gave us didn't distinguish between how often people traveled. And of course, one of the things which has changed dramatically because of COVID and the things that happened as a result of that is that people are not traveling so frequently. Um, and I, as a very tired person, I don't tend to travel every day as a commuter, but I am very dependent on the bus service uh, for both my community and leisure activities. And uh, I do think that it would be useful to know something about uh, how the frequency with which people travel uh, affects the kinds of answers they give. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Rupinda? Thank you, Joe. You know, I think one of the things I was going to say, you already said, is, is, is accountability in the current model we have is basically is non existent or is not, doesn't have any teeth in it. I'm a counselor in Coventry, as you know, and I sit on a West Midland combined authority, the transport committee to scrutinize them. But we have re no real teeth. Uh, bus operator can come and say this, they're going to shut down this route and we can't do much about it. Even on top of that service they are providing, the charging model for even for children, school children, the way they, they set some of the payment method is just ridiculous. They have to pay for the whole terms and they can't pay for one route in the day and all these kind of things are going on so accountability may exist in, in a paper but in a functional way it is non-existent and um, i think the value for money for the public purse is is completely out of the picture when we are talking about these uh, uh, conversation in a wider society there's a wide we may have a conversation regarding how much the value people pay to get on the bus or on the bus train, but the subsidies or the money government put it, how valuable that is for the community is is completely non-existent in the conversation. So I think corporate party need to play much more part in that. And in uh, West Midland, the bus model, we are going to get re researched basically for West Midland Combined Authority. So what my request is, is it possible to have some input from the corporate party to say when it comes, they will bring these researchers to us to have a, our view on it. And I requested them that if they don't have a skill set regarding corporate model, then I can ask somebody to come and help them. But I've been assured that they don't need that, but they will do the fair assessment of the corporate model. So I want to know if we have some help in some way where we can say these are the competitive uh, we, we can put forward to say this, this is something which is worthwhile putting some effort into it and how it can work. And okay. the last one is basically take a, there's a, I said there's a very limited accountability, but whatever it is there, I think if we can, if we can encourage everyone to take a little bit more in trust in their local councils or wherever they are to have a more input to educate even the councillors so this is the, what you need to do these are the questions you need to ask and that would be helpful that's all okay Thank uh, you. that's all Rupinda, you did very well i think you got five minutes, <laughs> uh to be fair a uh, remarkable skill. No, thank you, uh, Rupinda. Uh, and I want to bring, uh, I'm coming next to uh, Eleanor and Helen as well. Um, so just get ready, uh, Eleanor, Helen. Uh, but Louise, uh, just before I do that, uh, there was a piece there just around a frequency of use and the different uh, approaches of frequency of use, whether it's leisure, it's something through the daytime, whether it's commuting. Is that something which really changes that, 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 that data set that you have? 
Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a really relevant point. Um, how frequently people travel does have a big influence on how they feel about that journey. And things certainly have changed a lot since COVID, particularly frequency of people traveling to work. And I mean, if, if you think about how things used to be, um, people who were traveling sort of five days a week in the peak when you know those days where everybody had to be at their desk at nine o'clock and left at five so you had those really crowded trains that everybody commuting traveled on and they came home to get at the same kind of time um their experience was less satisfactory because they didn't get a seat and it was jam-packed and everybody was a bit you know angry and <laughs> shouting at each other to move down the carriage and that kind of thing but equally they tended to have um, a season ticket so their cost per journey was lower um, equally people traveling for leisure um, paying possibly better getting choosing to travel because often the fare was attractive to them you know I'll go to York if I can get a ticket for less than 30 quid if it's more than that I won't bother going so more of those discretionary journeys and tending to be a more pleasant experience where you had a reserved seat so there is a lot of analysis and as I was saying on the website um, it, it's all there looking at you know, some things are higher for people, some satisfaction is higher for people who make more frequent journeys. On other things, it's low, but it definitely does make a difference, frequency of, tra of travel, along with the journey purpose. Typically, people making a journey for a leisure reason, even if they're on exactly the same train, they tend to be more satisfied with their journey than somebody who's making it for getting to work or going on a business trip. And that's partly because of what they've paid for their journey. It's partly because of, you know, I'm going off to do something nice. So I feel better about going there than I do for something that I perceive as being less nice. Thanks. That's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, uh, Louise for that and it's an interesting way of thinking about uh, our own attitudes towards passenger uh, 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 public transport as well how do how we use it how, what, how does it fit into our lifestyle uh, a hugely important aspect of, of this discussion um, and Rupinda I, really interesting to hear the uh, the uh, experience of being on West Midlands uh, passenger transport um, I'm not in some ways uh, su su surprised uh, that there does feel like a, an accountability deficit. We'll pick up with you outside of the meeting some of the other points about how we can work together in that area. Other to say, on the value for money for the taxpayer and the fare payer, another adage of transport policy is there's only two places that money comes from in transport, and that's the the fare box or the uh, or, or, or tax pounds. And I, and I believe that's still to be the case. And I it's quite an interesting piece because sometimes when we hit we see ticket price and uh, and, and that there is also so taxpayer money going on top of that, otherwise it'd be much worse. There is subsidy. There is huge subsidy in train travel and, uh, and in bus travel as well as I, I was talking about. So they're the only two places. And that's why I think accountability is so important for us, because we're either putting it into the fare box or we're putting it in uh, through public money. There's only it's only us. It's no one else. Uh, but Eleanor, uh, over to yourself and then uh, Helen uh, after Eleanor. Thank you, Joe. So actually, I'm in quite a similar situation to Rapinda. So I'm a Labour and Cooperative Councillor in Leeds, um, almost on the Bradford boundary. I sit on the West Yorkshire Transport Committee. We've got Tracy as our Labour and Cop Mayor, which is great, but her powers are really limited by the government. Until she's been in for two years, there's very little she can do. And of course, the local Conservatives blame her for everything. Um, bus companies are taking enormous amounts of public money and as, as has been said, there is no accountability at all. It's all excuses. And how they get away with taking profit while essentially eating taxpayers' money is, is beyond me. So again, I'd like to look at what we can do from a cooperative basis to, to improve things here, um, because our services are under threat again of being cut. Some people have being cut off altogether, even though they're only eight miles out of the city, that they could lose their service completely when we come to April if the money doesn't come through. Um, and the whole thing stinks, quite frankly. Temperate language. Uh, no, but thank you, <laughs> Eleanor. Uh, I, I might even get there myself if I work my, uh, uh, through, through the course of the session. Uh, but I want to come back to that. Uh, Helen, uh, over to yourself. 
Yeah, I'm a councillor in Nottinghamshire and I think um, we have really good transport here. We've got a, a brilliant tram and um, good bus service, not everywhere, but where I am in particular, it's, it's really good. And as I'm like portfolio holder for the environment, it's it's the kind of clean transport that I'm concerned about, you know, biofuel and all those kind of things and electric buses and all that stuff. Um, but what is actually challenging our service at the moment is not having enough people to drive them. We're so short of drivers, that's affecting the service. I don't know if, if it's because like um, people say they've gone to work for Amazon <laughs> instead and we're losing our bus drivers to there. I don't know how true that is, but you know, a service can only be as good as the people who are working in it really. Um, but I have to say that you've really inspired me by talking about the community asset because I, I feel the co-op party should really run with this one and I feel it's, it's something that I'd like to locally get my teeth into and really fight for this because you know if, if you tried to take pensioners and um, bus passes off them they would commit murder they're so precious <laughs> so thank you for what you've said you've inspired me Thank you uh, for, for that, uh, Helen. Uh, I, I once uh, knocked on a door in Barrow uh, some many years ago and a lady came out swinging um, and I uh, fell backwards and scraped myself on the wall, couldn't believe it. Uh, and when the fracard died down, it was because of a bus service change. It wasn't even, a, it just there was someone on the doorstep with a rosette and that was it. The, you know the door came out and uh, and I and I docked for cover, but that's the passion that it elicits and the the need which it speaks to uh, in my mind uh, because not often uh, do do you have those uh, pieces. Um, the uh, and Lu Louisa come to yourself as well because I think there's something about uh, local authority involvement here. So we talked a little bit there about metro mayors and metro new metro mayor powers, and we're starting to see. Uh, metro mayors uh, take uh, positive steps, aren't we? You know, the, uh, well, from my point of view, that the mayor in Manchester has achieved something with uh, it, he, their, their new their, their new settlement. It's hugely controversial. Millions spent against and for it. Um, it was, and we saw there the two pound two pound fare uh, that Tracy has put forward as well, and others uh, have, have taken on. So we're starting to see local authority, um, regional government, much more involved. Is is that something which is quantifiable within people's understanding of the transport system that they have? Because some people won't quite understand is this something private public who's to blame is that are we starting to see a clarity of political accountability within within the work um i think clearly sort of people who live in more urban areas and who feel an association with where they live and they particularly where you've got choice of transport and integration of different networks is is important to them um, you know they they want somebody to be responsible for their travel and they want things to be easy to use they want things to be joined up they want it to be kind of you know make sense both from a financial point of view that if I buy a ticket can I use it on all different modes of transport can I use it across different operators they just want it to work and to be easy um, for them and we did some work just before um, before COVID when the, there was the initial sort of Williams review on rail and you, we heard from users on rail and I think it, it carries through into bus that you know almost the who is responsible for it is less important than somebody being in control who is designing things well, making it work so that ideally passengers can just rely on it and don't have to engage with anyone. But equally, if something does go wrong or they have got problems or queries, they know who is responsible, who they can take it up with and that they will be taken seriously. Um, so, you know, almost passengers and users shouldn't need to see the gubbins behind how it's structured the system and transport use should just make sense to them and of course 
you know the, the whole um sustainability agenda comes into play here and you know as we were saying about um as, as routes particularly on on the bus side are perhaps cut or services are reduced um some people are saying you know i'm gonna have to buy a car i don't want to but i can't rely on public transport anymore so i've got to buy an old car which really isn't isn't the ideal behavior in broader mm. terms mm. Mm. thanks and i think like from, from my point of view in terms of that sort of uh, control i think that that is something that metro mayors uh have an enhanced ability to exert, but it's only enhanced. It's not a, a, a remarkable carte blanche ability to exert control and accountability. They have an enhanced ability. So we now, and I think we're starting to see some of that come through. However, and most bus services won't be in a big met area. You know, they're, they're not going to be uh, in in some of these uh, larger conurbations that we're talking about. It's fantastic to hear Helen that. Uh, Transport, public transport in your area, and I know that uh, Nottingham and Nottinghamshire have got good integration, have got different modes of public transport, have got uh, a publicly owned, uh, uh, municipally owned, forgive me, uh, operator as well. Um, so it's really fantastic to hear that there is like bright spaces in terms of public transport provision, and we've seen from the data that a lot of people feel pretty good about getting on. Uh, and I bet if we did it in Nottinghamshire, I would imagine that to be a little bit higher as well, to be perfectly honest from what I know. And it's been an innovative place in terms of uh, car parking, car park charging, levy and other things are no controversial, but uh, it has been a place of innovation in public transport. Um, for, for me, I think that, uh, but it goes back to that piece about um, uh, 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 the, I suppose, the, the, the dice loaded against us. We need to change that narrative. We need to change the dynamic within our discussion between politics uh, uh, and, and public transport uh, service delivery. I think that we, we, we're we behind the times. I think we, we sort of stuck 20, 30 years ago about uh, in both in rail and, uh, and bus. And I think that some of the methods and pieces of uh, cooperative activity can start to change that dynamic. It, it won't solve it because we've talked about some of the fundamental problems, but it will start to change the dynamic. It will start to change the discussion. And I think that's a really important piece for us. Um, look, I, I need to bring in uh, many others as well. So Hilary and Andrew uh, caught my eye uh, next uh, on, on that list. So uh, Hilary, if, if you'd like to come in and then Andrew, uh, if you prepare yourself as well, mate. Hi. Um, Hi. I'd like to talk, I'm a senior rail card holder was um i was horrified about the idea of closing ticket offices because i prefer to deal with the human being but it's not that i haven't tried to deal with the technology and last year when i renewed my rail card i went online and they denied all knowledge of me um, they said they couldn't find a record of the number of my ticket that i put in I didn't exist, I wasn't a human being, and so I couldn't um, book a three-year card online. I had to go into an office and book a one-year card from a human being. Now, just recently, my card's expired. I've gone online again, and I've had to put in, well, I wanted a three-year card. I'd like a plastic one, thank you, a real one, not a, a virtual one going to my phone. And I put in um, a 30 number thing off my passport. And then I got a message saying that the website wasn't coping and they were trying to fix the problem. And so basically the technology is not working. So I'm going to have to go to my station and buy a one year card from a human being because the technology is not able to cope. Okay. So I'm just saying they're trying to force you to use um internet but the systems aren't aren't um viable great okay thank you hillary and Lu louise i'll uh, come to you there must there will be i'm sure uh, some uh reflection about the importance to uh, uh, uh users of uh, uh availability of staff what it makes them feel does it make them uh, is it better able to access the network as well uh, but andrew uh, coming to yourself next yeah thanks very much and uh 
Um, Louise, I think your, your analysis of the data was great. Um, I, I wouldn't be in your data set because I'm not a bus user. I used to be a bus user. <laughs> now we still have a bus stop, <laughs> and we don't have a bus anymore. So we, we lost our service. It's just gone. And, and we, we're, no, we're not able to feed back information about how good or bad the service is because the service has disappeared. Um, I, I completely agree with Helen. The service in, the, in Nottingham City and out as far as Hutnell is great, but I live in a corner of the county on the, on the county boundary, which is part of the problem because the county authorities don't coordinate you know, their bus services. Um, and we have basically lost our bus service altogether. Now, Joe's idea of valuing these as assets of community value is a really good one. Joe, you, you may remember that I was an active participant in the campaign that the co-op party ran to encourage registration of assets of community value. We applied to register all our green spaces in the three villages where we have a neighborhood forum. Um, and I got back a message from the council saying, you've tried to register more assets in one afternoon than we've managed to register in 10 years. Um, so the process is actually quite difficult as it stands at the moment mm. um, and also doesn't give very long-term protection. So it's yeah. great as an idea, but we also need to do something about the way the registration of assets of community value actually protects them because I don't think it's going to work very well at the moment. Yeah. Um, and also in the, time, in the situation where we're in, we're seeing housing development springing up all over the place while bus services are being withdrawn, you know, which is ridiculous because sustainability is supposed to be one of the criteria for approval of planning permission but then they're, they're not sustainable in terms of traffic and pollution because they're not in a situation where the bus services are being provided so i totally support all the efforts people are making um, and i hope we can do something um, particularly with the new government but i would also plead don't forget those of us who live in the forgotten corners on county boundaries in the corners of counties where away from the cities where they've got trams uh, and have to depend on buff services which are no longer here thank you thank you andrew and hillary um the absolutely right i think community asset uh, legislation more generally needs to be improved and it's something that we talk about uh, within uh, community power if we were to transpose it into uh, bus uh, routes obviously it would be new legislation give us the opportunity to get that drafting right, get those protections right. Absolutely right. It won't protect it in perpetuity, but it will change. It will hopefully change the dynamic of the discussion, change the ability for ourselves to campaign. But look, um, uh, and, and, and there's more points. Uh, I, I could do three hours, I reckon, with yourselves on this, definitely. Uh, uh, but Andrew, other points I'd like to come back to, but Louise, um, Hillary's uh, piece on uh, employees, uh, staff uh, visibility, hugely important to so many of us and so, so many of us within the cooperative and labour movement as well. Uh, just uh, any insight from yourself there about the uh, direction of travel? Um, I mean, people tell us all the time that staff are important to them. I mean, clearly, um, less people are buying tickets in a ticket office, more people are buying them online. So in some respects, having a member of staff available at a station, perhaps, you know, being out and about in a on the platforms in front of the by the ticket machines, helping people being available to help if people have got questions. Um, could could work as a solution um but yeah i mean you know for reasons of personal security if people have got queries people want to just make sure they're getting the best ticket staff are the way that that people like to do that and um equally on buses you know the importance of a bus driver being friendly and helpful makes a huge difference to satisfaction um and just quickly on andrew's point um totally i mean we we are we have done already and we are going to be doing more work looking at people who don't use buses currently and is that because they've stopped using buses whether that's because they've chosen to after covid or because bus services have been removed so they can't use them anymore um, or equally people who have never used buses what might encourage them to get back on board and start using buses um, alongside the sort of sustainability agenda and using cars less. Okay, thank you. Um, now look, we, we, we have run out of time. Um, we, I think there was more room for us to talk about rail 
as well. We 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 got involved in buses. Uh, maybe my fault um, <laughs> is my fault. But I think that there is things we need to talk about in rail as well. Um, I, I want to come back to that topic. I think that we there's topics about accessibility of public transport that we need to we need to talk about as well. Hugely important aspects uh, for ourselves uh, as users, uh, ourselves as uh, people who wish our communities to be uh, welcome and sustainable places. Um, so I want to come back to some of those pieces. I want to also come back. Uh, on some of the aspects of uh, what our model can do in, in other aspects of transport, because there are other, <laughs> we talked about two public, public transport uh, uh, modes uh, today, uh, but we are all people, we're not just bus users or rail users or motorists, we are people who use different modes of transport, and I think our cooperative values and principles and models has something to apply in other settings as well. So um, Izzy, uh, I hope uh, will, uh, uh, my colleague Izzy Uzzarelli, um will be uh, uh, allowing of us to come back to transport in the in the near future on Cooperative Live. I think it's a an important space for the Cooperative Party to be. Helen, I'm going to take you up. I'm going to have a go at it. I'm going to see where we can get to uh, within the within the party on, on on this particular issue. I think it's uh, uh, something that we have something unique to say, and we and we should probably well get on and say it. Um, so I'm going to have a good go at that. Um, and friends uh, who ha I haven't been able to bring in uh, today, forgive me. Um, I, we uh, we had some real amazing content and insight uh, from the WEEZ uh, Transport Focus today. I hope you found it uh, useful and stimulating uh, uh, to uh, to base our discussion. And thank you, Louise, for your time uh, to be with us here this evening. Uh, really, really interesting. I hope you come back as well. Uh, we, we, very we, happy welcome to see you back. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you, Louise. Thank you all uh, for joining us here tonight. And I hope you have a, a lovely evening. See you soon for more Co-op Live. Bye-bye.